Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Transforming Manufacturing Together Worker Centric 4.0 Solutions at the Digital Tech Talk hosted by Digital Factory Alliance. Please note this meeting is being recorded, so please, sure, uh, please make sure to unmute yourselves. I'm Ines Arias, uh, I'm a European project manager at Funding Box, and I'll be your moderator for today's engaging session. We have an exciting agenda ahead, exploring the latest developments in the digital transformation of manufacturing driven by European initiatives. Our agenda features three remarkable projects, Optimi, I4Q and Penelope, all of them part of the 4CDM cluster and funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 program. These projects focus on worker-centric, zero-defect manufacturing solutions. Optimi, our first project, is led by Nikos Dimitriou, uh, that aims to redefine the trade-off between resources, production time, quality, and performance using technologies such as artificial intelligence and digital twins. Our next speaker is going to be Penelope, that is going to be presented by the engineer um, Soi Arkaule, uh, addressing large bar manufacturing with a closed loop digital pipeline, linking product centric data management and production planning. And our last project today in the agenda is I4Q, represented today by Georgia Apostolou uh, and Miguel Angel Mateo. This project ensures the reliability of industrial data services through a suite of 22 solutions, embracing a zero defect manufacturing approach. These projects not only optimize processes, but prioritize the workforce, driving us towards Industry 4.0. So, without further ado, let's embark on this journey of innovation and collaboration. I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nikos Dimitriou, the Optimi coordinator. So, Dr. Dimitriou, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. Uh, thank you for your kind words and for uh, the nice introduction. So uh, give me a second to share my screen. Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. we can see we can see your presentation. It's in uh, mother. It's in uh, presenters mode. OK, so... OK, OK. Mm -hmm. Let me change that. Okay, and now it's better? Um, yes, now it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, my presentation uh, is about uh, work-centric solutions uh, that we're developing uh, in Optimi. And uh, how basically I'm going to give you a very brief overview about uh, how we have implemented zero defect manufacturing in Optimi and how we are using extended reality to make a ZM worker centric, okay? So uh, this is a, an outline of presentation. So a brief, uh, a brief summary of the concept of Optimize, then uh, a discussion, uh, very short discussion about zero defect manufacturing technologies in the project, and then a focus on the worker centric solutions uh, that we are developing. Uh, so uh, this is a very rough uh, conceptual overview of Optimize. So basically, uh, there are uh, five uh, independent components, let's say, in, or main technologies that are developed. The first has to do with the instrumentation of the production line, so developing smart sensors. Uh, the second is about real-time monitoring from uh, sensorial data and uh, analysis. Then is a part of AI uh, that is uh, responsible for detecting defects, early detection of defects. Then we have virtualization, digital twins, and so on. And finally, we have uh, a reconfiguration of the production line, either based on uh, AI uh, results or uh, through the use of uh, augmented reality. Uh, so what about uh, ZM technologies in the project? 
uh, we have, uh, I'm going to give you some two examples of, uh, of uh, zero defect manufacturing technologies for the project as they have been realized in two of the pilots. Uh, one, the first one is about uh, microelectronics. So uh, here uh, we have developed a system on a smart, on, uh, with a camera that is uh, that uses uh, an image, a high resolution image of, uh, of, uh, of electronic port to analyze defects on the port. Uh, so without going into too much detail, basically uh, what we're doing is uh, that, uh, you can see that better in the next slide. Uh, basically what we're doing is that we have this uh, setup that you see uh, here in the upper uh, left part, where we have a camera that uh, takes a picture of, of a PCB analyze the PCP to identify, uh, to identify regions of interest. And for each region of interest, it, it finds a defect. Uh, keep in mind that uh, this is a solution, an AI solution that can analyze uh, up to hundreds of, uh, uh, of regions of interest in, in, under, in under a minute. Uh, previously, you had to do it with a microscope, OK? So it's a, a pretty step. A pretty much a big step in automation for uh, uh, for this uh, for this particular electron board. So keep that in mind. We'll see how uh, we can uh, what we can do with uh, Excentral to make this solution uh, human centric. Uh, the second uh, uh, the second technology for ZDM is about uh, the detection of defects in uh, in antenna manufacturers in telecommunication. Uh, so uh, this is a, a system that uh, entails both a, a line scan camera and a, and a, a 3D vision system, a laser system. Uh, it basically identifies defects on, uh, on these uh, TV antennas. Uh, there are various types of defects that uh, might happen, like uh, uh, broken plastics or broken metallic rods. Uh, in any case, we are using this, uh, this type of sensors, analyzing uh, their signal on the edge near the production uh, machine and uh, identifying any kind of, uh, of defect there. And here, the process happens in real time. So we have a latency of uh, about uh, three or four to 400 milliseconds to make uh, to send the actuation signal that you know uh, something wrong is happening. So uh, both of these solutions are pretty nice developments uh, developments in terms of uh, ZM because uh, they can they they automate the inspection process, the defect detection process. Uh, but uh, what is added value for the worker? How is the worker uh, involved in, uh, in this pipeline? Uh, so uh, this take me, takes me to the more interesting part of my presentation. So uh, the first one, uh, the first uh, technological component that I'd like to discuss is the decision support system of, of, uh, of PMI uh, that we have, where basically the decision support system is uh, pretty much, uh, it's a it's a bigger, a more generic framework, if you like that entails many many different uh, aspects uh, of uh, of the project. In fact, is the central uh, integration point. So all technological components are uh, one way or another linked to the decision support system, uh, and this includes components for administration, defect detection, monitoring, prediction, historical data analysis, uh, configuration events, everything. Uh, but but the most interesting part and the one that we'd like to discuss today uh, is how the inspection results are, are visualized here. So. Basically, uh, you see from the two examples I previously uh, presented for the electronic ports and, uh, and uh, the telecom antennas, you see how the results from, uh, from the AI are visualized here. Uh, so this is, uh, this is not just a visualization endpoint, though. Uh, in fact, the worker can uh, can take a closer look at the detection uh, results here. Uh, and by taking a closer look, he can even correct the AI in case there are misdetections or uh, there's something erroneously classified as defective. Uh, the worker is able to, to correct this, to, to revise uh, AI suggestions. 
And uh, through uh, this uh, revision, uh, we are able to retrain our AI models and in this way, improve them in the long term, uh, improve them through human experience. Uh, so that's that's one way on how we involve uh, the human in the loop uh, here. Uh, I implement this, this active learning pipeline. So uh, AI results or AI models learn from uh, human feedback and, and evolve and uh, improve over time. Uh, also keep in mind that this is not uh, something that we did, uh, you know, just for the sake of involving the human uh, in uh, the AI loop. It's it's based on a very very basic problem that all industries have. Uh, you know, uh, defective parts are very sparse. You know, otherwise the industry would go out of business. The factory. Uh, defective uh, events are are very very sparse. So, it's. It's not realistic to anticipate to have 2,000, uh, let's say, or uh, 20,000 defective parts to train your AI model and uh, make it very robust before you deploy. But what you can do uh, with this active learning through the BSS uh, framework, you can collect data as you go, deploy a, a model that maybe is not that robust at the beginning, deploy it, make it learn through uh, human revision and human feedback, and at the end, you know, after a period of time where you have enough data, uh, let it be autonomous and uh, operate on, on its own. So uh, that's uh, that's one part of, uh, that's one component, human centric component that we have developed in the project. Uh, here you can see uh, more details on, uh, you know, the actual visual interface uh, where the human can select different regions in the picture, uh, designate, you know, the particular type of effect. Uh, whether you have, uh, you know, broken rod for the antennas or whether you have too much glue for uh, for the electronic ports. Uh, also, uh, here you can see, uh, in fact, some tests that we did uh, where uh, through this active learning process, the accuracy of uh, the AI model does increase. You, you can see this increase in trend of, uh, of accuracy through this uh, human uh, interaction because the model uh, gets more um, uh, it's retrained based on the corrections of the human. So it does make a difference in this active learning pipeline. Uh, and uh, as a final note, uh, we have also uh, developed, uh, we have also connected to the DSS a blockchain model, uh, which basically can store this kind of revisions of the human. So we can have a, a very good track and immutable track of uh, what corrections have been made uh, on the DSS. Uh, so to highlight uh, some uh, interesting aspects of the DSS, we have the annotation, the active learning part, uh, effect detection and monitoring, uh, and finally uh, the notifications. You know, the DSS also does provide some recommendations of the human. But uh, we'll see more of the, that in uh, the following slide. And finally, having the blockchain to have transparent and immutable uh, documenting of uh, anything that, everything that happens. Next, uh, another human-centered technology that we are developing uh, for optimize is uh, based on extended reality and basically on augmented reality to, to be more precise. Uh, and because we have uh, some, uh, we are working also on, on VR, but uh, for digital doings, but today I'm going to focus on, uh, on the augmented reality part. So basically here uh, we have developed a bundle of modules that run parallel, that uh, run on, uh, on uh, AR classes, on, uh, the, on wearable area classes, that basically analyze the scene that the worker is, uh, is in front of the worker's eyes. So here we are doing many different computer vision tasks, for instance, segmentation, pose estimation, and gesture recognition. Uh, and based on this analysis of what the worker sees, we can help him provide him some, uh, uh, some, uh, some insights. For instance, this is from one of the use cases that we have here, uh, which is for elevator manufacturing. Uh, we can analyze the viewpoint of the worker and see compare what he sees with a bill of materials and see if he has everything uh, he needs for uh, uh, to carry out his task. So here's, here is an example uh, where we identify the different parts before he's about to assembly uh, a hydraulic uh, lift power unit. 
Uh, now for pose estimation, uh, we have also uh, some videos here where basically we can identify the pose uh, of different parts. So here for the valve block, you see how we identify the 3D bounded box of it. Uh, here for a PCB, how we can identify you know, the orientation of the PCB and for the antennas, the same thing. But okay, I, I can, it's, it's natural to consider, you know, okay, so you are doing this uh, 3D pose estimation, but uh, how does this uh, help in the shop flow? I'm uh, going to see uh, in, in a while. Uh, before we go there, another uh, component that we're developing is about gesture recognition, uh, where uh, the application is quite obvious. If we use it to send actuation signal based on what the, uh, the worker wants to do. Uh, so different uh, gestures to, can mean different things for, uh, uh, for different use cases. So for the thumbs up, maybe in one of those cases, it means to initiate the inspection process. Uh, then with uh, different numbers designated with the fingers, select different menu items uh, with a fist to stop and return to the home page. But even uh, configuration actions, this could be, you know, uh, we can make this uh, uh, to stop a machine or not. So here, basically, you see how these uh, gestures are uh, recognized. Now, see, just it's number one, or now we'll change to number two. Yeah. So you see, we can identify a gesture uh, in a very fast uh, with very small latency. Uh, and going to see that again, how we will, uh, how we apply that in uh, in the subflow. Uh, Okay, I'm going to skip this to save some time. Uh, but for the gesture part, uh, to give you an example of uh, how it's useful in the shop floor, uh, we can use gestures from the worker to configure uh, pieces of machine in the shop floor. So, so uh, here is from elevator manufacturing, from one of the use cases we have, where basically the worker has uh, uh, to turn left or right a valve block. Uh, the valves on a valve block, uh, so he can calibrate it uh, optimally to, to control the motion of, uh, of an elevator. Uh, basically, what we have done here is, you know, previously, you know, the worker had to take an Allen key, plug it in each of the valves and turn it left and right. Uh, what we are doing right now is that we have developed a structure where uh, uh, you can see it, uh, here on the bottom right picture or a top view on on the top left picture where you know this allen keys directly plug in the valve block and they are controlled uh, with gestures uh, from the worker so he can make keys up you know go left or right and this indicates that uh, he wants to turn the respective uh, uh, Valve, no left or right. So uh, we do the configuration uh, based on the gestures that he does in the air without him actually having to to go uh, and key or even go inside the and have the, the configuration. Uh, another example. Uh, uh, yes. So uh, this is basically uh, the vocabulary that we are using. I'm going to show you the video because I've already seen this. So. Uh, Numbers here indicate which uh, valve you want to calibrate. Left and right uh, indicates the movement, uh, the uh, movement of the motor. A static fist is to stop the calibration. And uh, the, okay, the thumbs up means that calibration is complete. So uh, this is uh, the vocabulary that we're using in that case. Uh, next, uh, what is uh, that? What brings me back to the 3D pose estimation? Uh, that I previously discussed about and how it can be used for human centric for worker centric solutions. Uh, we are uh, we are using uh, we are we want to use that in the pilots of uh, of optimize so that we can uh, enable real time inspection. Uh, imagine that we have machine that to see what's happening inside. So we want to minimize human intervention in different to reach areas uh, and minimize also unneeded stoppages. 
So what we are going to implement is to use AR glasses and when the worker turns his head not for some machine, give him a light view. What is happening inside? Uh, I think we may. Am I the only one that is experiencing problems with uh, with this presentation? Is uh, is Nikos frozen at the moment? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, I, I think maybe that he's having bad connection. Yeah, okay. Uh, so please, those that have the camera on, if you can please switch it off during the presentations. Uh, let's see if like that we can improve the, the connection. Otherwise, let's, let's give uh, Dr. Dimitriou uh, a couple of minutes for, to reestablish his, his connection. Um, Dr. Dimitriou, if uh, you can hear us, uh, could you try to uh, leave the meeting and, and come back to see if we can uh, reestablish the connection, please? And in the meantime, I, I ask our audience to, to please be patient with these uh, technical problems. <laughs> Thank you. Nichols is still online, so I wonder if he's even aware of this issue. Yeah, I, I texted him uh, in a private message. Um, I think now he left. <clears throat> Can you confirm that uh, that he left? I still uh, see him. He's actually connected. He just um, seems to take his camera off. Okay. I so let him also... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Let's uh, let's give him a minute. Otherwise, we can uh, we can jump to the next presentation and come back to to his later on. Well, I got a message from him. He's connecting in about one minute. Okay, okay. So so let's be a little bit patient and he yes. will reconnect. Thank you. Thanks, Thank George. You.
well in the in the meantime while we while we get wait for dr dimitri linda uh we mentioned that these three projects uh optimi i4q and penelope are members of the four CDM cluster. Perhaps in our audience is a representative from a project that could also take part in this cluster. Um, if you could, uh, I don't know, tell our audience what the four CDM cluster is about and if it is, if there are openings for other projects to, to join, um, it could be also, I think, a good information for, for our audiences today. Yes, of course. Um, thank you, Ines. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the uh, ZDM for ZDM cluster, uh, it's a group of projects and um, horizon projects uh, that do does welcome new uh, projects all the time. So uh, do get in touch and we have I'll put the uh, website link to the joint uh, cluster website here in the chat. So do get in touch. Don't hesitate if you are um, interested and you're not yet part of the cluster. I see Nikos has joined us um, now. So let's see if his connection works better. Uh, go ahead, Nikos. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Linda. And sorry to everyone for uh, uh, for the interruption. I had a problem with my connection. And I don't really know uh, where you lost me. Uh, which part of the, my presentation uh, he lost? Uh, it was near the end, I guess. Well, if I may, Nikos, it was about the new uh, feature about the X-ray. Um... Okay, 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 okay. So, yeah, uh, very, very, very short. I'm gonna keep very short so that we don't uh, uh, don't mess too much with the schedule. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, here, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, sorry, sorry for sorry again for the interruption. I, I'm so, I'm going to just give you an overview of this slide and and stop, uh, because uh, I believe that's a very interesting part, and this connects uh, the 3D pod estimation that we're doing with an actual application in the shop floor. Uh, so basically, uh, this X-ray module, which uh, it's X-ray for you know, uh, X-ray as we're doing the medical examination, but also for extended reality. Uh, basically what it does, it, it allows the worker to see behind obstacles, okay? So imagine that you have a PCB, as we see in the example here, which is occluded, it's, it's, behind, it's behind an obstacle. And by using the view uh, from a camera, from a camera which is outside our field of view, uh, we can register this uh, this uh, view uh, to augment the reality that the worker uh, has on. Uh, so, for example, uh, the worker that stands in the picture on the right that stands behind this uh, this white uh, uh, separator, let's see, uh, let's say, uh, he can see the actual PCB that that stands behind. Okay, and uh, and we do that. Uh, by 3D pose estimation of the PCB uh, and uh, multi camera registration. Basically, we transform the viewpoint of, uh, uh, of the camera that sees the actual uh, PCB to the viewpoint of, uh, of the worker. And why this is important? This is important because it allows visualization uh, behind obstacles. Uh, the, you know, imagine that the PCB is inside a 3D, inside the electronic circuit printer, and you don't want to open up the lid, but you want to see what's happening inside. We, we can do it like that. Uh, visualize what's happening inside and, you know, have uh, green for uh, good parts or red for uh, for defective parts. So uh, that's it from, uh, from my side. And sorry again for, for the delay. No, that's uh, that's perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dimitriou, for that insightful presentation on on Optimi. Um, please remember that you can already write your questions in the chat box. We will address them in the last part of the webinar with a Q and A session. And now we proceed with the next project presentation today. Um, that is Penelope. 
Uh, please join me in welcoming the engineer Soi uh, Arcule, a research engineer from the University of Patras, the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Aeronautics. Good morning, Soi. Hi, good morning. Thank you for introducing me. So, yes, I'm a research engineer at the University of Patras. And uh, let me share my screen. Yes, please. Can you see the slides? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Now maybe? Now we can, yes. Yes, thank okay. you. The floor is yours. Okay, so in the Penelope project, I'm Work Package 3 leader. This Work Package is related to the worker-centric tools. So I will introduce the wide range that we have. Uh, of course, I will start with the Penelope project overview so that uh, you can get an idea. Probably you already know uh, due to the cluster what we're doing, but in any case, I will repeat. Uh, then we will have some challenges that uh, we face in large parts manufacturing. This is where Penelope focuses. And of course, some requirements that we needed to facilitate. And then we will start with the important and uh, I guess more interesting part, the tools. So what are the challenges in large parts manufacturing? Uh, we can say that uh, first of all, the components are complex. They require large sequences of tasks so uh, they are also highly manual. We will elaborate more in the next slides why. Uh, they are time consuming. And this is also reflected to the design and construction preparation. Uh, we see a lot of uh, deformations. The tolerances are not to the level that uh, the end user wish. And uh, so the European competitiveness in this sector is, of course, relying uh, on the knowledge and skills of the workers. So we need to preserve uh, the industry-specific knowledge of the workers. So uh, Penelope has as an overarching objective uh, the development of a closed-loop digital pipeline for flexible and modular manufacturing of large components. We are 30 partners that are working in this project and the implementation of our tools will be uh, will take place in four pilots um, coming from the oil and gas, shipbuilding, aeronautics and bus and coach sectors. So you can see we have one of a kind um, production and low volume. So uh, we have five technical objectives. Of course, the closed loop data driven pipeline, the digital architecture that uh, will allow for modular reconfigura reconfigurable, scalable, decoupled and distributed production zero defect manufacturing, which is also the reason that we are in this cluster. The worker-centric tools, which are expected to enforce worker workers uh, by assisting them in their execution of the labor-intensive tasks. We will see the four axes where we support operators. And then, of course, we have the real scale demonstration. So, uh, let's focus now on the important part. Why we need these tools and uh, what inspired us to work in these cases. So, as we saw, uh, based on the pilots, but also on the market, uh, la large parts manufacturing is typically one of a kind or low volume. The processes tend to be complex the parts are made of different sub-assemblies, so we have a lot of sub-steps in the processes. Parts come often in different tolerances. They deform 
during manipulation or handling. So we need a lot of craftsmanship on the shop floor. Uh, at the same time, the parts are heavy, maybe sometimes not even possible uh, to manipulate by one person or two. Uh, so we have a lot of troubles. You can see in terms of human factors what this means. Uh, first of all, uh, we have the potential of MSDs. Uh, there is physical stress. We have also a lot of high mental stress because the operators need to constantly make decisions. So how do I respond if the part is not in the wanted tolerance? Uh, what should I do if I see some deviation? How do I report uh, some unforeseen event? How should the management be approached, etc.? And we can see some of the requirements uh, that were shown to us, the developers, by the end users. So we need to prevent non-ergonomic postures, possibly by integrating robotic manipulators. We need to increase production responsiveness by allowing operators to directly provide feedback, because usually we have this feedback provided uh, in daily meetings, and sometimes this introduces a lot of delays. We need to reduce the process time while improving accuracy and efficiency in process execution, reduce programming and setting times, and of course, improve training methods and enhance operator support on the shop floor. So here we can see um, indicatively some of the solutions. Of course, we have always human in the center. And uh, we have a series of tools to support. So uh, the programming can be supported, for instance, with AR tools. Uh, we can have human-robot collaboration to allocate difficult tasks that include discomfort to the robots. Um, for large workspaces, we have cable robots, which are uh, more, which allow to have more degrees of freedom for the manipulation of large parts compared to typical cranes. Uh, there is also zero programming solutions. Um, and then AR operator support aside uh, from human robot interaction just for the manual processes, and finally, offline training uh, via VR tools. So let's see what happens for the intuitive human-robot interaction. Uh, we have indirect interaction. So here, the, the human does not touch the robot. We have sensors that um, track what the human wants to do. For instance, create these uh, waypoints, then show the planned path and allow the robot to execute the path if we agree with it. And there is also um, this feature where we can directly drag the robots and the factor to the position that we want. And we have the benefit of seeing the robot's configuration while we're moving the robot. Uh, this is extremely valuable because uh, sometimes we have singularities and the robot is moving a bit um, not as expected. So here with this feature, we make sure that the operator is always aware of what is going to happen. So we increase uh, situation awareness, and uh, this is planned for the commissioning of the robot. So not production stage, just setting up and uh, defining the robot path. So for the robot programming, we have also the direct interaction, hand guiding techniques. Uh, here humans can move the robot manually by applying forces on it. And uh, we have again 
the benefit of easy trajectory programming. And here we have one more benefit. The robot can work as work holding device to move heavy parts. Uh, then a common element uh, with the previous presenter, we have gestures. Here we detect them uh, with uh, an electromyography sensor. And this sens uh, these gestures allow to command the robot. Uh, we're talking about high level commands uh, like uh, initiate task, return to home position, stop, continue, or pause task. And then uh, we can move to the robots and what they can do. Uh, on the left, we can see a robot which can be either um, manipulated with a TP or work automatically. It's uh, for very large parts, let's say. It can automate the handling of the parts and also assist the assembly. And on the right, we can see uh, an example of a collaborative robot. In this case, it's also mobile. And it is integrated with a digital twin. Uh, for instance, here we can see when the sensor is on. Here we have some sensors to monitor the process, which is the gluing. Uh, but we have also integrated um, different sensors like uh, safety scanners on the robot, safety radars on the structure, etc. Then uh, another tool, it's also for programming, but uh, this time we are talking more about uh, software, not direct uh, human robot interaction. So we start with a human. They are performing the process as they would usually do. Uh, we record data. And then, as you can see, we can uh, extract the robot path. And then, uh, using PathML, which is a form of uh, automation ML, but also uh, robot simulation, we can transform the path uh, to whichever robot motion we need. For instance, you see here uh, in the example, we have the tool moving. So the operator is moving the glue gun, uh, but in the application, it's the robot that is moving the window. Of course, here we have reduction of time and effort to integrate the digital solution and uh, more efficient transferring of monotonous tasks from workers to robots. Uh, so this tool is uh, teaching by demonstration. It's called robot mimicking. And uh, we continue with more zero programming. Here we have two different cases. It's uh, milling and part inspection. So here from CAD and CAM data, including data from the actual environment, uh, we adapt to deviations and disturbances of the environment, and we actually generate the path of the robot. Now we move uh, to operator support and what we provide, we provide to the operators for manual processes. Here we have an inspection case. Uh, we have the overlay of uh, NDT results, non-destructive testing. Uh, in this case, it's serography. And there is also um, the marking of the area that's, that needs to be checked. Apart from that, there are methods developed for repairing. In this case, it's a resin infusion based. We have step-by-step -step instructions for the execution of the repairing as well. And uh, you can see that we have tested exoskeletons as well to check if they are beneficial for the human. 
of course, we have more paradigms. Uh, here we have um, support for the measuring of parts. Uh, we have two cases, one in oil and gas and one in shipbuilding. So this allows to track physical objects um, and check if we have deviations. Also, uh, it, supports, it supports the design and generation of parts uh, for the connection of uh, tubes. One more AR-based tool, it's a projection tool that helps for calibration, that uh, helps, sorry, for the tracing uh, of cuts to be made uh, on oil and gas tubes. And then we proceed with the offline training. Of course, here we have uh, one big target, which is um, familiarizing with working next to the robots. Here, it's important to familiarize with the notifications that we see in the systems, but also the behavior of the robot that uh, usually changes. So, um, for instance, um, in speed and separation mode, the robot stops if you are very close to avoid collision or it uh, slows down depending on the distance of operator and the robot. And then it's also usual, uh, useful to know which tasks should be performed by the operators, which by the robot, uh, how far we need to be at its place, etc. And then we have also training for hand guidance and uh, other tasks. And then uh, there is finally uh, the VR-based human-centered task design. So uh, while we're executing tasks in VR, we are also collecting data in order to decide if we need some redesign to improve efficiency, uh, to improve postures, etc. You can find our solutions in this booklet. Um, so you can expect around actually 11 modules for safe modular and flexible robotic technologies, six modules for intuitive human robot collaborative solutions, nine modules for AR and VR tools. And uh, this is the work of 17 different partners. Here is where you can find us online. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Zoe, um, for sharing insights into the Penelope project. I have shared the link in the chat box to the booklet that Zoe was just presenting. Um, please remember that you can leave your, your questions for Zoe in the, in the chat box. And now let's explore our final project of the day, that is I4Q. So please welcome Dr. Dr. Uh, Georgia Apostolou and uh, Miguel Angel Mateo from the Center for Research and Technology, HELAS, Information Technologies Institute. Good Hello. morning, Georgia. Hello. Good morning. And Hello. Miguel Angel, good morning. So you can share your screen. The mm -hmm. floor is yours. Can you see? Yes, we can see it perfectly. Thank you. Good uh, action and all to for the invitation of I4Q project uh, in this webinar. I'm Georgia Apostoli from CERF, and together with my colleague Michel Angel from UPD, we will uh, present you the I4Q project. OK. Uh, I will start uh, with a short intro. I know that most of uh, of us already know uh, what it is about. Um, manufacturing companies uh, are facing the challenge of redesigning and adjusting their systems 
to produce goods adapted to specific requirements and produced under the minimum uh, required production rate, guaranteeing high quality and limiting the use of resources. Uh, I4Q project provides uh, some uh, solutions, a complete uh, solution consisting of sustainable IoT-based reliable industrial data services, able to manage the huge amount of industrial data coming from cost-effective smart and small size interconnected factory devices for supporting manufacturing online monitoring and control. At the moment, we are on the third year of the project. So normally the project uh, would end at the end of December, but uh, we uh, got an extension of five months and uh, we will finish on May uh, 2024. Uh, so um, we have uh, already produced all our uh, tools, uh, the solutions that I will tell you more about that later on in the next slide. And now we are on the stage that we are uh, um, integrate our solutions in the solution in the um, factories in the pilots. Uh, for this project, we have six pilots from different uh, sectors. From white goods, we have the Whirlpool uh, for wood equipment, Bize, metal machining, Fidia, ceramics, pressing, Rheostone, plastic injection, Farplus, and metal equipment factor. Today, we will give you an example of one of these uh, pilots and more specifically of uh, factor. Um, we have uh, um, developed 22 solutions in total. From these, 17 are software tools and five are guidelines. Um, this tool set uh, is able to assure data quality, traceability, and proper use to achieve manufacturing lines, continuous process qualification, quality diagnosis, reconfiguration, and certification. Our solutions uh, are divided into three groups. The first group is about manufacturing data quality. So there we have uh, the following solutions. Uh, quality Explorer for data quality factor knowledge. Uh, there the users can explore factors that affect the data quality characteristics as a, such as accuracy, precision, timelines, credibility, and completeness. Uh, trusted networks with wireless and wired industrial interfaces. Uh, paying special attention to requirements there, such as predictability and determinism, uh, high reliability and trustability, and low consumption, while reducing the installation cost of new wired infrastructure. A data repository, a flexible and scalable storage tool that allows customers to select a storage technology where to store uh, their data, a blockchain, and a security handler uh, that provides security mechanisms uh, necessary in the industrial environment. The second group includes uh, solutions uh, for the manufacturing data analytics and uh, quality assurance. Uh, there we have uh, data integration transformation services, uh, which is a tool that makes a pre-processing of data before using this into other solutions, not only for my 4Q project, but also in, it can be combined with solutions uh, that are, all, or, that are already in the markets and uh, are used by the factories. Uh, we have services for data analytics, analytic dashboard, digital twins, uh, models distribution to the edge, big data and analytic suites, infrastructure monitoring, uh, service for monitoring manufacturing lines, uh, detecting uh, failures and provide alerts, and uh, edge workload uh, placement and deployment, which is uh, automatic smart delivery of AI workloads to the appropriate edge uh, devices. The last one, group three, uh, rapid manufacturing line qualification and reconfiguration includes the following solutions, uh, data-driven uh, continuous process qualification. Um, uh, this tool applies statistical methods, uh, real-time process cap capability is calculated which describes the scaled alignment to the desired quality range, descriptive analytics tool, rapid quality diagnosis, which is a microservice that supervises the quality conformity of products and provides visual assistance to the machine operators through quality metrics and graphical representations and manufacturing line reconfiguration toolkit. Um, all these solutions are combined uh, in the pilots in order to solve specific problems. Um, 
I will give the floor to my colleague Michel Angel to continue with uh, an example of one of our pilots, which is Factor. Yes, thank you, Georgia. Uh, well, good morning. My name is Miguel Angel Mateo, and I belong to the uh, Product Management and Engineering Research Center at the UTPB in Valencia, Spain. And well, the idea is to make a, a presentation about the pilot uh, factor. Uh, well, um, Factor is a Spanish company specialized in the design and develop of the uh, custom metal parts uh, for, my dear, uh, for many other companies. Um, one of the most important challenges is the need to adapt quickly to the development of new parts. Um, this is uh, due to the fact that they don't develop a single product, uh, but uh, one that changes over the, the month. Uh, one of the most important value that, that uh, they're focused is in the quality of the final product and the reduction of the failures when he developed the, the, these new pieces, uh, approaching a little bit with the paradigm of the zero defect of manufacturing. Uh, if you pass to the next slide, Georgia. Um, as you can see in this slide, uh, we uh, install uh, different solutions from my 4 q in this in this pilot with the intention to provide uh, more quality improvement in the different development of the life cycle of the product. And uh, these solutions are distributed in four different servers and are directly to connect to the machine production. In this case, the the machine is uh, one machine that name is Nakamura Two. Uh, thanks to this, uh, we can obtain uh, the data directly from the machines uh, with, because the machine provided different internal sensors and, and act more precisely with the solutions in, 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 this, uh, in, in this machine. Uh, as you can see, there are several tools developed in this project uh, implemented in, in, in this pilot. To continue with the next slide. Uh, yes. Um, for analyze the 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 the, the, the status of the the, the 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 development of the product and the implementation of the 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 for key solutions, um, we have a different KPIs to cover from the quality of the control of the product to the automatic correction of the machine process. All these KPIs um, are reflected in the OEE. Uh, this, uh, the main KPI for, uh, that factor has to measure the, the quality of the production of the process. Uh, we can say that uh, at the end, uh, all this quality will be reflected in, in this value, in the OEE. In fact, if you continue with the next slide, Georgia. Mm -hmm. The, the OEE that uh, has been improving uh, through the project uh, in its initial phase uh, they have an, they have a uh, 62 percent of, uh, of the in, like a initial value and currently uh, he go in the 71 level uh, good idea of the objective of the, the the factor is try to arrive to the 88 percent at the end of the project uh, at the end of the project of type for cube. However, um, this value, uh, the, these values are not entirely realistic uh, in the last months because uh, uh, the company are including new machines uh, with more sensors and change some uh, aspects inside the, 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 the line. And well, we can see that the, the last month um, we, uh, we see that the KPS is done, but it's not a real value. Uh, in the middle, uh, we see that the, the quality uh, is increasing at the long of the time. Uh, these things we can see in, in other KPIs, if you continue with the next uh, slides, like the ability or the effectiveness. Uh, uh, all these values uh, provide the image that the the, the 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 introduction of these tools and the 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 the, the digitalization of the line uh, product uh, a good overview about the state of the the, the factory. If you pass to the next slide, other measure is the the quality radio that we can see that uh, all goes in, in a good way and well the the last. Uh, 
uh, value the the number of the stops well it's increased because we need to uh, the factory need to do do some stops to the new products and the 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 the, the new machines that it's included inside the factory uh, if you continue with the next slide uh, with all of this, uh, the idea is to share one of the a demonstration of the videos. Uh, we decide to share the Trusted Network video because it's an um, interesting uh, tool with a hardware component. And well, uh, Georgia, you can you can share and yes, I will share another screen now for the video. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will show you the TN. Mm -hmm. Acid networks. Um, yes, we it. can we can see it. Yeah, There's you can even. Can, can you can... hear the sound? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. You can... Yeah, you can even make it full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. I put it from the beginning. The following video shows the software defined wireless sensor network deployed in fact part of the trust network solution of the IPOQ project. The solution is based on several wireless nodes that use a reliable and resilient communication protocol, powered by a centralized coordination of the SDN control. Several wireless nodes has been deployed at factory, placing the gateway in the middle of the industrial plant. The nodes support different industrial interfaces, such as Fertrich and Bolt and Modbus Arterial. The use case tries to identify consumption patterns of a few years so, predicting the rate where. Using the web interface, an operator has access to all the network information, such as the connecting node and also the network to follow. The collected results allow us to identify the radio resource allocation and also the quality parameter of all the data flows. During the next steps, the information of the use case application will be processed. Um, and well, uh, this is one of the, the solutions uh, you can see in the video. Um, uh, this solution provides the possibility to deploy different uh, hardware elements at the end of the, the factory. Uh, with these hardware elements, we can take uh, specific data from different points like the humidity uh, or if, you, if we put it in, inside the machine, the vibrations uh, and this kind of thing that provided uh, to the rest of the solutions or other solutions from the for other uh, projects. Um, there are other solutions uh, that presented Georgia. If, if we wanted, we can uh, share the, the video. That is, for example, the DAT. It's a, bit, it's a solution that take the, the data directly from the machines and clean it this data to, to send it to the rest of the solutions or to other solutions uh, provided in the marketplace. Uh, similar than the infrastructure monitoring. Infrastructure monitoring take it data directly from the machines and when appear an, an alarm, uh, he send it an, an this alarm to the operator and try to do the adjust uh, that needed inside the machine or something uh, uh, other solution that you can see here is the PQ. The PQ is a solution that uh, uh, um, provide overview of the state uh, in on live the, the, the qualification of the, the, the data that arrives. Uh, all these solutions uh, are working in the idea to, to just uh, with uh, live data and provide as, as soon as possible a, a, a good result to help in the production line. And what well, this is all for the factor case. Um, it, don't just yes, you can pass the next don't forget to follow in the network socials uh, as you know we are at the end of the project and we are here to solve all the questions thank you all
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for for your presentation. Um, so I think we can all agree that we have had a great set of insights from our speakers. Thank you again for being with us today. So now for the last part of today's webinar, let's open the floor for the questions from our audience. So please feel free to submit your your questions in the in the chat. I will just uh, to break the ice make uh, a question while you write yours in the in the chat to to our speakers. So my question to to all of you it's um, one of the things that we talk most uh, when we talk about um, European projects is sustainability uh, most of the times, but we also talk about replicability. So my question uh, to you is if you can discuss uh, with, with our audience, what is the potential re replicability of your methodologies and, and products yeah, to other industrial sectors that are not uh, the specifics to, to your projects? We can begin, for example, with our first speaker, um, Dr. Dimitriou. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ines. Uh, so, uh, about replicability, uh, at least for Optimai and based on what I understood for the other projects, uh, there is potential to, to replicate uh, most of the solutions. Uh, but there is also a need to, to adjust to its, to its factory. Uh, because you need, always you need to study the use case. You need to understand you know, what kind of de defects happen there. Uh, what are you know the breaking points of each process? That's the first step. Then you need to fine tune your solutions that you have for defect detection, reconfiguration, whatever you need to do to adjust based on this use case. And then finally, you also need to integrate to you know to talk to the actuators in uh, in, in the production line to the robotic arms or the PLCs. So there is also this kind of integration effort that is uh, that is needed. But the, the paradigms, the, the pipelines, the, the general concepts, I believe that they can be replicated, but there is effort involved in that. Yes, we also talk, for example, in the case of Penelope, uh, that is implemented in Bass and Coach, Aeronautics, Oil and Gas. Uh, so, would you like to comment on, on the replicability of uh, the Penelope methodology? Uh, uh, on my part, it's it's uh, it's very interesting, very impressive uh, because uh, they cover a lot of many different domains. Uh, yeah. So uh, I know that that's not easy, but maybe yeah. uh, this uh, Arculi can give you a better uh, better idea of that. Yeah. So uh, you are, are muted. muted. You are muted. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, thank you. So indeed, uh, as you saw, there is a range of solutions. Uh, some are hardware dependent, some others are not. Uh, so this also um, links with the replicability of uh, methodologies and results. For instance, uh, VR tools are much more easy to integrate. We just need data, geometric data, data about the task and uh, maybe some precedence constraints and then it's easy to simulate tasks uh, of course there is a challenge of the number of steps that we can simulate its time so this is uh, what we worked on how to make easier and feasible to simulate larger sequence of tasks for AR tools again uh, it's uh, more challenging because we have also the actual world uh, in the schema of the solution. But again, uh, it's uh, okay to proceed and uh, adjust methodologies. Uh, we saw great work from TTPC in the measuring of uh, tubes and they have actually transferred, I think, the solution uh, from shipbuilding uh, to the oil and gas. So there is already an in-project paradigm, how to move from sector to sector. 
uh, again, I think uh, the matter is how to calibrate uh, the solution with the environment, how to achieve tolerances, uh, because the overlay needs to be accurately projected um, on the actual part. Uh, but again, it's a matter of data. We have some integration in the bus and code sector with other tools. For instance, VR, AR, and uh, the task planning for repairing, they have to be integrated. So we're working on a solution where uh, the partner IPC who have developed the repairing methodology uh, indicate the steps for its type of defect. And then these steps uh, through the Skillworks platform of TTPSC, and uh, we're also testing the digital thread of Penelope, uh, will be shared uh, for AR and VR. So what, what they first is the instructions to the operators, um, and then how to calibrate with the environment. When we have robots in place, um, we are currently working with ROS, so from the moment a robot has a ROS driver, we can uh, replicate the methodology. Uh, so it's AR and uh, robots. For the hand guiding, um, I'm not really sure because it's uh, the development of another partner. I think the methodology remains, uh, but we have to respect uh, the constraint of its robot, the constraints of its robot. Uh, we have worked with ABB and KUKA robots inside the project, so we already worked on the replicability. Um, the cable robot is uh, somehow challenging um, to transfer from case to case because it requires a lot of work in the design and manufacturing of the robot, but it's doable. Again, we have two cases, one uh, shipbuilding and one bus and coach. Uh, collaborative robots, <laughs> it depends. Uh, do we need the manipulation task? It's just inspection. For the inspection part, it's easy. We have done entity inspection and the uh, vision laser-based inspection with the same robot. It was easy. It took uh, one month. So it pretty much, it depends on the requirements and what we want to achieve, how different it is from the baseline uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Zoe. Um, some uh, inputs from Georgia and Miguel Angel regarding replicability. Yes, sure. In our case, I think that the tools are not so complex as in Penelope. I see the differences. Uh, so in I4Q, the aim uh, is to use these tools also in other uh, factories with uh, other kind of data, um, of course, with some adjustments. I mean that depending on the case and the data that we want to use in order to have the results that we need, uh, there might uh, be necessary to do some um, adjustments, updates on each one of the tools. Uh, but uh, I think that easily could be implemented in other uh, cases. Maybe with some guidelines, of course, always this is uh, very useful, but not with uh, great um, uh, adaptations and major uh, changes. That's, uh, yeah, that's great. Um, we have a, a question in the chat that I think it's a very interesting one. It's a question to everyone. So the question reads as follows. Uh, we are interested in hearing more about the human feedback aspects in the project. How would you describe the feedback on your human-centric tools received from users so far? And if the, uh, if has the feedback been mainly positive or negative uh, and uh, has it result in significant changes to the tools uh, functionalities or interfaces um, we can begin with uh, dr dimitriou yes uh, so uh, on our part uh, the the feedback has been mostly positive uh, and uh, as as you saw in my presentation 
the feedback is uh, not only just evaluation. We basically want the, the workers to use longer term our, our tools so that we can also gain from their expertise and knowledge with this active learning and uh, decision support uh, annotation based uh, feedback. Uh, but you know, mostly the answer is that the feedback has been positive. Of course, there has been uh, there have been concerns uh, with uh, some of the workers, you know, because you know some of them might feel threatened because automation. You know, okay, maybe I will lose my job in the long term. So there, there are these kind of uh, of concerns. We need to be uh, sincere about that, uh, uh, because you know, ideally, if automation progresses factories won't need any workers at all in the end. Uh, but uh, our answer to that uh, as a project, and uh, me personally as a scientist, that, uh, is that uh, you need to, to help, uh, based on uh, the background of each worker, to help them evolve you know, and obtain. So you need also to have, uh, not only take feedback from the workers, but also you need to, to train them, to upskill them, to, you know, to show them, show them the, the way that, you know, through uh, using this technology, you can also learn, you can evolve uh, in your profession as well. So that's it from, uh, from my side. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, in this case, um, did you have you have any feedback from uh, um, the implementation of these uh, tools? Uh, again, I will reply in levels. Uh, VR solutions, uh, they are quite appealing, I can say. They are well appreciated. And, uh, okay, the scope is to gamify how to learn the process. So, yes, it was quite positive, the feedback. Uh, about the projection tool, we know there were several iterations. So, we are working with the end users to improve the tool. Uh, I think it's well appreciated by humans. Uh, what has been worked on is the accuracy. AR, it's uh, for the tubes, it's also positively received. As for the robots, uh, we need yet to test it with operators because uh, in the cases where we have them, the robots are not yet at the end user's place. So, in order to get the operator's uh, feedback, uh, we need to wait a bit more. Uh, from past experience, we know that uh, it's well received. Uh, of course, there are some things to work on. Uh, for instance, uh, the autonomy of the device. But this is not our job. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we are limited to the application side. And uh, then for the robots, uh, Okay, it depends. Uh, sometimes it's positive, some other times it might be intimidating. Uh, it's a matter of how we design the application. Is it that we're taking the job from workers? Is it that uh, we're combining uh, what they're doing together? We are taking discomfortable tasks that no one wants to do. Mm. It depends, it depends. Mm. For instance, yeah. gluing, it smells awfully, so people are quite happy not to do it. That's very good. Thank you, Zoe. Um, we have also uh, Georgia and, uh, and Miguel Angel. Uh, would you like to, to comment on this? Yes. Uh, well, hello. That's my turn now. <laughs> so, far, well, we have tested it with the engineers and the pilot representatives because uh, this solution, we want that the solutions work correctly inside the factory because effectively in the final product. Uh, but directly with the plan operators, uh, we don't have interactly in this moment. In fact, the idea is in, in the next five months in the extension of this project, uh, try to have a feedback uh, directly from all the stakeholders that interact with the solutions uh, from, from the, the business level uh, to the operator at the end that it will be used at the, the solution. Mm. 
Thank you very much, Miguel Angel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I have here in the chat a question for uh, Dr. Um, Nicolos. Uh, <laughs> so the question reads as follows. Optimi explores the rapid reconfiguration of production equipment. How does this contribute to a worker-centric approach and what challenges may arise in ensuring the seamless transition for workers? Okay, well, indeed, interesting question. So, uh, for uh, for Optimi, the configuration uh, can be uh, it, it, it's not uh, uh, you know uh, it can be either autonomous, meaning that you have AI that does the configuration to adjust the process and optimize the process, or configuration might mean that uh, it, it is done uh, by the worker. Okay. And I'm talking about, you know, online reconfiguration, uh, not about planning for production in, in using a digital twin and then applying this, uh, applying this reconfiguration to the software. I mean, uh, it's online, so you can uh, go next to your, uh, to your uh, machine and do some gestures to reconfigure some parameters, or you have on the edge an AI module with reinforcement learning or whatever uh, that monitors the process and adjusts, micro, does micro adjustments to configure and optimize the, the whole process. Now, uh, about how this contributes to the worker centric approach, uh, there are two ways here again uh, to do it. Uh, as you saw, uh, with the augmented reality part and the gesture recognitions, uh, you can have the worker uh, basically perform the reconfiguration uh, task. Uh, so you can, uh, with, uh, with the gesture, the vocabulary that we have developed of gestures, it's uh, different gesture signals a different reconfiguration action, like things like, you know, slow down the conveyor belt or stop this machine or uh, tune up this parameter these kind of, uh, of things you can do with gestures and uh, reconfigure your production. Uh, the other part of uh, reconfiguration, which is, uh, 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 which is autonomous, it does not involve the worker uh, at first uh, glance, but it does involve him uh, when he corrects uh, actions, uh, configuration actions through the DSS, through the decision support system. So uh, when an action, a configuration task is automatically done and it is stored in the blockchain of uh, Optimi, uh, because that's the way uh, it right now works, uh, the worker can go in the DSS and say, no, uh, you, you, did just, you did this, uh, this wrong. Uh, and through this feedback, uh, the AI, reinforcement learning agent, whatever uh, kind of AI model you have, uh, can learn from this, uh, from the human, from this experience and, you know, don't repeat the same mistake again in uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, now about the challenges that arise uh, in ensuring a seamless transition for workers. Yes, there are a lot of challenges, that, uh, not only technological ones, uh, uh, because you know the technology might be there. Uh, but uh, the biggest challenge in, in my part is that you need to. Uh, to change the mentality of the worker. You need to explain to him what this thing does. Uh, you don't necessarily, of course, you don't you don't present him with uh, the mathematics or uh, equations or, I don't know, but you have to give him a clear picture of what uh, this technology that you are proposing or that you are integrating does, okay? Uh, explain to him clearly uh, what uh, his expected role is in this technology, whether he, you know, how he's expected to use it or how he's expected to help it. And also, again, uh, repeating my previous answer, you need to, to help him understand that this is an upskilling task for him as well. So he learns, he will learn new things, and he will uh, develop new, uh, new expertise uh, through his involvement with, uh, uh, with these technologies. So that's the biggest challenge on, on my uh, on my view. My yeah. View. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time, uh, but before uh, we close the, the webinar, I would like to just uh, pose a question to, to all of our speakers. That is, um, 
there is always this fear, right, that the workforce uh, or the workers will not be as needed in this uh, upcoming industry 4.0, yeah? So my question uh, to you is like how you envision, how your projects envision the support to this uh, workforce transition towards industry 4.0, how you are preparing, for example, in the case of Penelope, um, there is an expression of interest coming with trainings. Uh, is there something like that? Um, skills uptake uh, that you are planning on? Perhaps we can open this uh, question with Soy. If so, is Hi, available. sorry, yeah. I was a bit confused because you provided uh, the answer. We do plan to have some <laughs> trainings. So, yes, uh, first of all, as you saw in all of the solutions, we keep human in the loop. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, let's talk about the robots because for AR and VR, it's quite obvious. Uh, so what uh, we want is what we envision to do is uh, to get monotonous jobs that uh, require also maybe high accuracy to the robots, uh, whereas we keep uh, more interesting creative tasks that require maybe flexibility, decision making or, or improvising uh, for humans. This is the target. Uh, so do end user like it. We need to work a bit on the efficiency that uh, we achieve in the human-robot collaborative scheme, uh, but for sure there is potential. And uh, yes, uh, also we have these trainings that you said, so we hope to make uh, people uh, more keen with uh, programming these uh, ARVR applications, using them. There is also training for the col human-robot collaboration, robot programming. Uh, there is a wide range of trainings. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, Dr. Dimitriou, do you have uh, some initiative like that uh, in Optimai? Well, yes, in Optimize we have a, a task that is dedicated to, to training and upskilling of, uh, of workers. So, yes, uh, we, are, uh, we are doing that. Uh, you know, basically, the, the goal for these training activities is to, to enhance and highlight the new uh, role of, of the worker in Industry 4.0. Okay, because uh, it eventually comes to that. It's not that you don't need humans at all. Everything is automated. It, it's that humans uh, now uh, should do other different kinds of tasks. So uh, that is the focus in the training. Basically, we want to, to show them you know, uh, how things uh, are changing uh, based on the technology that we're developing and technology industry 4.0 in general. And then uh, explain to them what is their role in this in this transition and, and where they are still needed yeah thank you um so uh the the question same for dr Opastolu and miguel angel uh, we also include training in our uh, um, tasks uh, um, it is already started with uh, uh, the people that use these solutions inside the pilot. Uh, but of course, um, through this training, we are trying to improve our tools. So depending on the feedback that we receive, uh, we are trying to make some adjustments and make it uh, um, easier for the persons that use it, uh, to use it and understand the results and also make it uh, more friendly, let's say, uh, to people that have no technical knowledge uh, on the specific tools. Um, there is already interest um, for some of the tools, also from externals, and I think that um, they could provide help uh, to uh, employers um, um, with problems such as the quality of the final product or the machine. Uh, so I, I find it uh, useful and I think that in the next years 
tools like that will be used broadly in the manufacturers. But if you want also direct feedback, I think that some colleagues of, uh, of us from Factor, Pablo and Alfredo are here. So maybe they can comment on that also, like what they believe about uh, the uh, tools that uh, you, they use now in their uh, factory. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, we, we are running out of time, but if they okay. want to have a, like a one minute uh, <laughs> comment on that. Uh... Yeah, if you want, we can just uh, very, very quickly then. Uh... In, into that, in the sense we were exactly talking about that. Uh, I mean, we, we consider, first of all, two, two very quick ideas in this. Uh, it is extremely useful because we are connecting our indicators, our key indicators, the OEE, uh, with a layer of data analytics that uh, without that, we are not able to improve uh, our production uh, uh, targets uh, in terms of quality, availability, and uh, and performance. Uh, on the other hand, we, we must not forget that we are talking about projects which are, are TRL uh, 7. Uh, the, we need only to think about something that is pretty simple, but is not in our domain of expertise, uh, is ergonomy. Uh, any any new tool, even with the best of the ergonomy, is is a has an obstacle for is a new thing in the shop floor. Uh, if we add uh, the right ergonomy or we integrate this tool properly into the ergonomy of the existing tools, uh, it, it can be very useful. It can be very very useful because it's very connected with our productivity and efficiency targets. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful insight. Thank you very much. Thank you're, you. Thank you, welcome. Alfredo. Um, so as I said, uh, we run out of time. So from my side, I just uh, would like to to give a, a big, big thank you to, to our speakers, uh, a big thank you to our audience, and also a big thank you to uh, the DFA for, for hosting us today. I hope you, you, you found this webinar as, uh, as interesting and, and refreshing and informative as I did. So with that said, um, we welcome you to visit the, the websites of Optimi, I4Q and Penelope, and also the 4 c the um, uh, cluster. So thank you very much for being with us today and see you next time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.